I'm really, really happy to be here in Illinois. I have a slight case of laryngitis, which I hope will disappear as I speak, but um, I had a wonderful dinner here uh, with some of the faculty and some of the directors, and I, uh, I got to meet Dr. Letterman and, uh, and uh, Director Cipriano, we call it Cipriano in, in uh, the East Coast, where there's, uh, uh, I guess, a larger Italian population. Who, <laughs> Um, and, uh, and Senator Welsh, who shared with me a poster that he had handed out a flyer of my father uh, uh, in 1968 when he was working in Indiana, and that was it. I, wherever I go, people always uh, uh, come up to me and, and share stories about my family, and it's, you know, it's a great, very touching for me and all the members of my family that 30 years after my father's death and, and uh, uh, my Uncle Jack's death that people still remember them with such high regard and affection, but wherever I go since I, I was a little kid, people come up and say, you're Bobby's son, or you're Jack's nephew, or you're Ted's nephew, or you're Joe's brother, or I'm uh, going to <laughs> Maryland, my sister's lieutenant governor, and they say, oh, you're Kathleen's brother. Well, I, I live in New York. When I go to Massachusetts, every other person comes up and says, I knew your father. <laughs> but, um, in the last couple days, a lot of people have been saying, oh, you're Arnold's cousin. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, you know, one of the things that we talked about uh, at dinner tonight, uh, which was great, we talked about farm policy and how that uh, in Illinois and about the big hog farms that are coming to the state, which I have a big interest in, and, uh, and about the control of the state agencies, uh, particularly the agricultural agencies by the, by the Farm Bureau and, uh, and by big, you know, corporate agriculture and the big chemical companies and how this impacts life on the ground and life in the communities and how destructive it is of the American way of life and our democracy and all the values that we really care about as a nation. And to me, that's what environmental activism is about and advocacy is about. It's not about protecting the fishes and the birds for their own sake. It's about recognizing that, uh, that those are part of it, that nature is part of our infrastructure. And that if we want to meet our obligation as a civilization and as a generation and a nation, which is to create communities for our children that, that provide them with the same opportunities for dignity and enrichment as the communities that our parents gave us, that we've got to start by protecting our, our environmental infrastructure. Uh, I, I, two weeks ago in New York City, <clears throat> New York Times carried a, an article that said that one out of every four black children in New York City now has asthma. Uh, three of my own sons have asthma, uh, and it's a debilitating disease, particularly for one of them um, uh, who's had, who had 23 emergency room visits by the time he was three years old. We don't, uh, nobody in my generation had asthma, my family or my wife's family, and we don't know why there's an explosion of this, uh, an epidemic of asthma now, but we do know that the asthma attacks are triggered by bad air days, for when there's a particularly ozone and particulates. And we know that the primary source of ozone and particulates, at least in the New York City area, is coming from these giant uh, dinosaur coal-fired power plants in the Ohio Valley that have been burning coal, um, that were given a, an exemption under the Clean Air Act to continue to operate because they had been built you know, in the last 20 years and with big investments. They were given an exemption, but they were supposed to um, change their, uh, their processes and upgrade their processes uh, by now. Uh, and, uh, but however, uh, a month ago, President Bush wrote exemptions, changed the law so that now these uh, facilities are exempt and they never have to stop polluting. Um, in in uh, uh, Connecticut, well, I live a mile from Connecticut, this year we found out the New York City Reservoir System where I drink from and I've been working on for many years and we've been protecting for a hundred years and most of it is in wilderness area or, or farm area that the fish are too contaminated to eat. They're contaminated with mercury and they're, they're unsafe to eat. There's no geological source of mercury in the watershed of the New York City Reservoir System. That mercury, 40% of the mercury, it's coming out of the air and 45% of the airborne mercury in the emissions in this country is coming from those same power plants um, that we're supposed to shut down. Um, we have in the Adirondacks, in, in, I live two miles from the state of Connecticut. In Connecticut, it's unsafe to eat any freshwater fish in the state, if you can imagine that. You know, my children uh, and, and the children of Connecticut are deprived of the, of the fundamental, um, you know, 
a primal, seminal uh, American youth experience of going fishing with their fathers or their mothers and eating the fish. Uh, the, Ad Ad the Adirondack Mountains, which is the oldest wilderness area uh, in the world uh, and has been protected since the 1880s, uh, half the lakes are sterilized now from acid rain from those same power plants. And, and, and that acid rain goes all the way up, you know, it, it's, it's destroying the forest carpet all the way up the Appalachian chain into, into Canada. And the same industry, if you go down to West Virginia, where I was last Friday and flew over the Appalachians, is cutting down, literally cutting down a mountain chain, destroying these historic landscapes, which are the source of our values and our virtues and our characters. So people with Daniel Boone and Davy Crockett. And you know, the history of America is being dismantled by these giant machines that, um, that practically dispense with the need for human labor. There's six or eight men uh, employed on those sites destroying, dismantling an entire mountains and then dumping them into the nearby rivers. Well, um, which is, was illegal until quite recently when the Bush administration said, we're going to allow them to do mountaintop mining and dump it into these streams. Um, so we're, you know, we're living in a, in a science fiction nightmare. This industry, the coal and utilities between them, they gave $48 million during the last election cycle to the Bush campaign. And because of that, uh, because of that, they're getting billions of dollars now um, in, uh, I, 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 in benefits from that small investment, and the rest of us are paying the debt. You know, we are living in a science fiction nightmare, if you think about it, where the fish in our communities are too poisonous to eat, where the air is poisoning our children. We're bringing children into a world where, where the, children, the air is too poisonous to breathe because of a campaign finance system that allows these large corporations to bribe public officials to, to hurt the public and to hurt our communities. And that's really what ultimately this battle is about. Are we going to protect the public trust assets, the commons that we all share in common, the air and the water, and really ultimately our values as a people? Or are we going to allow those things to be uh, corrupted and compromised through a, a, a corrupt system where, where, where politicians can be bought by money to hurt the public at large? Um, the people who started the organization that I work for, which is Riverkeeper, and I'm the president of the Waterkeeper Alliance, which is all the riverkeepers from around the country, around the world, <clears throat> the people who started it back in the early 60s were people who understood that uh, protecting the environment is about protecting our communities, that this is the infrastructure of our communities. These were people who probably never used the term environmentalist to describe themselves. They were people who were fighting for their livelihoods, their property values, um, their recreational values. Uh, and, uh, and it was started by a group of a blue-collar coalition of commercial and recreational fishermen who mobilized in the Hudson Valley in 1966 to reclaim the river from its polluters. Uh, we have on the Hudson one of the oldest commercial fisheries in North America. It's 350 years old. Many of the people I represent come from families that have been fishing the river continuously since Dutch colonial times. It's a traditional gear fishery, meaning they, they use the same fishing methods, the ash poles and the gill nets and the small open boats that were taught by the Algonquin Indians to the original Dutch settlers of New Amsterdam and then passed down through the generations. And um, let me get some water, excuse me. One of, the, one of the enclaves of the commercial fishery on the Hudson River is a little village called Crotonville, New York which is 30 miles north of New York City on the, on the east bank of the river. And the people who lived in Crotonville in 1966 were not your, you know, your prototypical tweed jacketed, pipe smoking, bearded environmentalist who's trying to protect distant wilderness areas in the Rockies or you know, Montana or what have you. They were factory workers, carpenters, lathers, electricians. Half the people in Crotonville made their living or at least some part of it crabbing or fishing the Hudson River. For the most part, these families had little expectation that they would ever see Yosemite or Yellowstone or the Everglades. For them, the environment was their backyard. It was the bathing beaches and the swimming holes and the fishing holes of the Hudson and the, and the Croton Rivers. Richie Garrett, who was the first president of the River Keepers, used to say about the Hudson, it's our Riviera, it's our Monte Carlo. Uh, Richie Garrett was a grave digger from Austin, New York. He used to tell his new followers, I'll be the last to let you down. I didn't. In 1966, Penn Central Railroad began vomiting oil from a four and a half foot pipe in the Croton Harmon rail yard. And the oil went up the river on the tides and it blackened the beaches and it made the shad taste of diesel so that they couldn't be sold down at the Fulton Fish Market in the city. And all the people 
in Crotonville came together in the only public building in the town, which is a room about this size, and it was the Parkerville American Legion Hall. This was a very patriotic community. There were 300 people there that night, leaning against the rifle racks, hanging from the rafters, and they stayed there till one o'clock in the morning. And they were almost all former Marines. This was uh, this is the most patriotic community in our country. It had the highest mortality rate of any community in the United States during World War II. Um, almost all of the original founders and board members and officers of Riverkeeper were former Marines. Uh, Richie Garrett was a former Marine. They were combat veterans from World War II and Korea. These weren't radicals, they weren't militants. They were people whose patriotism was rooted in the bedrock of our country. But that night they started talking about violence because they saw something that they thought they owned, which was you know, the abundance of these fisheries that their parents had exploited for generations and the purity of the Hudson's waters and it was being robbed from them by large corporate entities over whom they had no control. And they'd been to the government agencies that are supposed to protect Americans from pollution, to the Corps of Engineers and the Conservation Department and the Coast Guard, and they were given the bum's rush. They were told at one point, after 20 separate visits to the Corps offices in Manhattan by Richie Garrett and another Marine named Art Glauca, the Corps colonel finally told them in exasperation, these are important people. Speaking of the Penn Central Board of Directors, we can't treat them that way. They have political power in Albany. And by this evening, in other words, we can't enforce the law against them. And by this evening in March of 1966, virtually everybody in Crotonville had come to the conclusion that government is in cahoots with the polluters and that the only way that they were going to reclaim the river for themselves is if they confronted the polluters directly. And somebody suggested that they put a match to the oil slick coming out of the Penn Central pipe and burn up the pipe. Somebody else said that they should float a raft of dynamite into the intake of the Indian Point power plant, <laughs> uh, which was at that time killing a million fish a day on its intake screens and taking food off their family tables. Somebody else said they should roll a mattress up and jam it up the pipe and flood the rail yard with its own waste. Then a guy stood up whose name was Bob Boyle, who was uh, another Marine, he was a Korean War vet, and he was the outdoor editor of Sports Illustrated magazine. And he still is today, he's been there for 55 years. He, and he was a great fly fisherman and angler. He was one of the gurus of dry fly tying in this country. He'd written half a dozen books on angling. And two years before, he had written an article about angling in the Hudson for Sports Illustrated. And in researching that article, he had come across an ancient navigational statute called the 1888 Rivers and Harbors Act. And that statute said that it was illegal to pollute any waterway in the United States, that you had to pay a high penalty if you got caught, but also there was a bounty provision that said that anybody who turned in the polluter got to keep half the fine. And he had sent a copy of this law over to the libel lawyers at Time Inc. And he said, is this still good law? And they sent him a memo back saying, in 80 years, it's never been enforced. But it's still good law, and it's on the books. And that evening, when all these men were talking about violence, he stood up in front of them with a copy of the law and the memo, and he said, you know, we shouldn't be talking about breaking the law. We should be talking about enforcing it. And they resolved that evening that they were going to start a group that was then called the Hudson River Fishermen's Association. It later became Riverkeeper. And they were going to go out and track down and prosecute every polluter on the Hudson. Eighteen months later, they collected the first bounty in United States history under this 19th century statute. They shut down the Penn Central Pipe for good. They got to keep $2,000, which was a huge amount of money in Crotonville, New York in, in 1968. There were two weeks of wild celebration in the town, and, and they used the, the money that was left over to go after Sebagaygi and Tuck Tape and Standard Brands and American Cyanamid, the biggest corporations in America, and, and I, against the government agencies that then and today are the biggest polluters in our country, the Corps of Inge or the, the uh, National Guard for, going at, for filling a wetland in Peekskill and Westchester County for dumping toxics at Croton Point. In 1973, they collected the highest penalty in United States history against a corporate polluter. They got $200,000 from Anaconda Wire and Cable for dumping toxics at Hastings, New York. They used that money to construct a boat, which they called the Riverkeeper. They hired, using bounty money in 1983, their, their first full-time Riverkeeper, a former commercial fisherman named John Cronin. He hired me year, a year later as the prosecuting attorney for the group. I was working at that time as a prosecutor in New York City, at, in Manhattan, at the DA's office just doing you know, regular uh, criminal law. But I'd always wanted to work on the environment. I fell in with these fishermen and began um, uh, working for them pro bono, and they hired me uh, eventually, and I've been doing this for 20 years. But we started about a year after um, I went to work for them. We started at Pace Law School in White Plains, New York, which is a law school that specializes in environmental law, a litigation clinic, environmental litigation clinic, 
which I supervise today with my student, with, with my partner Carl Copeland, and we have, in conjunction with my work for Riverkeeper, we have 10 third-year law students who, by a special court order, are permitted to practice law under our supervision as if they were attorneys. They can do anything a lawyer can do. We give each of the, the students four polluters to sue at the beginning of the semester. They file complaints and they do discovery, they do depositions, they go to court and file their cases. Two months ago, uh, three of my students uh, won the biggest um, municipal penalty case in the history of the Clean Water Act against New York City. They did all the work, did all the argument, uh, $5.6 million plus about $100 million in restoration of, of a trout stream that the city had destroyed up in the uh, Catskill Mountain. A famous trout stream called it Sopus Creek. But uh, of course, if they don't win the case, they don't pass the course. And <laughs> since, we've, since we started the clinic, we've brought um, over 300 successful legal actions against Hudson River polluters. We forced polluters to spend over $3 billion now in remediation of the river. And today, the Hudson River is an international model for ecosystem protection. This is a waterway that was a national joke in 1966. It was dead water for 20 mile stretches north of New York City, south of Albany. It caught fire. It turned colors. Uh, today, it's the richest water body in the North Atlantic. It produces more pounds of fish per acre, more biomass per gallon than any other waterway in the Atlantic north of the equator. And it's the last major river system left on both sides of the Atlantic. And, I, and I'll throw in the Mediterranean and the Black Sea and the Baltic and the Marmara and the Bosphorus, the Dardanelles, the, the Aegean, the, the Adriatic, all of the rivers that flow into all of those waterways. There's only one left that still has strong spawning stocks of all of its historical species of migratory fish, and that's the Hudson. It's Noah's Ark. It's a species warehouse. It's the last refuge for many of these animals that are going extinct elsewhere. And the miraculous resurrection of the Hudson has inspired the creation now of river keepers across North America. We now have a license, we license, uh, the, we own the name, we license new river keepers to get started. We have them, uh, and each one has to have a patrol boat. Uh, they have to have a full-time paid river keeper and have to be willing to litigate against polluters to protect their local waterways on behalf of their local communities. We have them on all the major rivers on the west coast from Cook Inlet in Alaska, we have four of them on Puget Sound, all the rivers that go into it. Uh, we have them on the Tuolumne, the Willamette, the Columbia, San Francisco Bay. We have five river keepers on the rivers that feed it. San Diego Bay, uh, the Orange County coast, the Santa Barbara Channel, all the way down to Laguna San Ignacio in, on the Mexican side, the Baja Peninsula, where there's a Mexican fishing cooperative is licensed as a keeper. And on the East Coast, on all of the major rivers, from the Bay of Fundy in Canada to the St. John's in Florida, we have nine of them on the Chesapeake Bay. Um, uh, and uh, we have, uh, we have uh, explosive growth in the Midwest. Uh, this is one of the only states we don't have a keeper, actually. We have, I think, seven of them in Michigan. We have them in Wisconsin, Ohio. We have Illinois bracketed, but we don't have one in this state yet. But um, we have 300 applications for new keepers. Um, we have explosive growth in Canada, too, and most of the Great Lakes on that side have, have keepers on them, the Canadian side. But um, within probably five or six years, we'll have keepers on every major waterway across North America. We're the fastest growing national environmental group now, uh, and we're licensing keepers all over the world. I'm going to Australia this summer to license six, uh, to launch six river keepers on the major rivers in Australia. Um, uh, and I love my job. I love what I do. I love uh, being on the water, um, uh, going to court, fighting against the bad guys, teaching the students, uh, and you know, just uh, and being able to represent the, the fishermen. Um, but a couple of years ago, my clients asked me to do something that I never wanted to do, which was to spend a lot of my time in Washington, D.C., lobbying Congress, and particularly the anti-environmental provisions that, that began with the Gingrich Congress in 1995 and now have culminated in, the, uh, in this White House, which is the most anti-environmental White House in the history of our nation. Um, and, uh, and I have to say this, my, um, my clients are fishermen. Uh, they run the range of the political spectrum from right-wing Republican to left-wing Democrat, everything in between. Sometimes I go out on the water with them or I go to the bait shacks at the end of the day. Um, and you know, just listen to them talk, uh, and uh, some of the stuff they say is scary. But without exception, <laughs> they see what's happening uh, in Washington today as the gravest threat, not only to their livelihoods, but to their values, their sense of, of citizenship, uh, their sense of community, 
uh, of civilization. Um, and they're right. If the laws that are currently proposed by the Bush White House, and there's over 100 anti-environmental rollbacks, major anti-environmental rollbacks, and you can see them, they're listed on the NRDC what, website, and I think the Sierra Club website too. But if even a fraction of those are passed over the next year, we will, by this time next year, have effectively have no significant federal environmental law left in our country. That's not exaggeration. That is not hyperbole. It is a fact. Many of our laws will remain on the books in one form or the other, but they'll be unenforceable. And we will be like Mexico, which has these wonderful poetic environmental laws, but nobody knows about them and nobody complies with them because they can't be enforced. Now, if you ask the people on Capitol Hill who are promoting this kind of legislation, why are you doing this? What they invariably say is, well, the time has come in our nation's history where we have to choose now between economic prosperity on the one hand and environmental protection on the other. And that is a false choice. In 100% of the situations, good environmental policy is identical to good economic policy. If we want to measure our economy, and this is how we ought to be measuring it, based upon how it produces jobs and the dignity of jobs and how it preserves the value of the, of the assets of our communities over time, over the long term, over the generations. If, on the other hand, we want to do what they've been urging us to do on Capitol Hill, which is to treat the planet as if it were a business in liquidation, to convert our natural resources to cash as quickly as possible, to have a few years of pollution-based prosperity, we can generate an instantaneous cash flow and the illusion of a prosperous economy. But our children are going to pay for our joyride. And they're going to pay for it with denuded landscapes and poor health and huge cleanup costs that are going to amplify over time and they'll never be able to pay. Environmental injury is deficit spending. It's a way of loading the cost of our generation's prosperity onto the backs of our children. And if you don't believe that, if you have doubts about that, look at the nations that didn't invest in their environment back in the 70s the way that we did in this country. All of our environmental investment began on Earth Day 1970. And I remember what it was like before Earth Day. I remember the Cuyahoga River burning for a week and nobody being able to put it out. The flames that were eight stories high. I remember when they declared Lake Erie dead. I remember that I couldn't swim in the Hudson or the Charles or the Potomac growing up and what the air smelled like. In Washington, D.C., which wasn't even an industrial city, we, some days you couldn't see out of the block for the smog. We, uh, we had the dust in our home every day for soot. Um, we had thousands of Americans dying in our cities during smog events that, it, it, at that time. These young policymakers on Capitol Hill, they don't remember that. They don't see the benefits that we've gotten through our investment in our environmental infrastructure. All they see is the cost of compliance to their campaign contributors. Um, and, you know, I'll tell you another uh, story. Um, Director Cipriano mentioned that I'd written a book on falconry. And I'm a uh, falconer, I'm a licensed master falconer, which means I, I take uh, hawks and I train them and, and hunt with them. And I've been doing this since I was 11 years old. And I just stepped down as president of the New York City Falconers Association. And I breed hawks and I ban them for the Fish and Wildlife Service. And I was banning them this weekend with my, with my children. And um, I, 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 I have a rehabilitation center for injured northern uh, raptors at my, at my home. Um, but uh, I was interested, my mother says obsessed, with hawks <laughs> since I was uh, three or four years old. And when I was nine, beginning when I was nine, we, my, my uncle Jack was in the White House and you know, we lived on, in Northern Virginia. And I would go up uh, with nine or ten of my brothers and sisters to eat lunch with my father uh, once every couple of weeks at the uh, Justice Department or go over to the White House occasionally. And whenever we'd go see my Uncle Jack, we, I would um, I, I'd look down Pennsylvania Avenue to the old post office building in Washington, D.C., where there was a pair of Eastern and Adams peregrine falcons nesting on the roof. And they'd been there for generations, and all the falconers knew about them. And this was our most spectacular predatory bird. It was the most beautiful um, uh, of all the subspecies of peregrines. It was salmon pink. It had a beautiful white sear, on, uh, coverlet on its sear. It could fly 240 miles an hour. It was the fastest bird on Earth. And I could watch these birds come off the roof of the post office and come down Pennsylvania Avenue at those speeds and pick pigeons out of the air 40 feet above the heads of the pedestrians right in front of the White House and then fly them back to the cupola of the post office. And to me, seeing a sight like that was far more exciting than, than visiting my uncle at the White House. <laughs> but that's a sight that my children will never see because that bird went extinct in 1963 from DDT poisoning, the same year that my uncle was killed. 
And, um, you know, we have peregrines now back on the East Coast and in Chicago uh, on, on the buildings and stuff, but it's a different bird. It's a hybridized progeny of 17 different subspecies that were mixed and matched and bred in captivity and then released into the wild. And it's nowhere near as spectacular as this creature that took a million years to evolve and then disappeared in the blink of an eye because of ignorance and greed. And you know, many of our, I never saw egrets or herons or ospreys or bald eagles growing up. I see them all the time now, not like bluebirds that disappeared. Many of our songbirds were disappearing. In 1970, this accumulation of insults drove 20 million Americans out of the street, 10% of our population, the largest public demonstration in United States history, demanding that our political leaders return to the American people the ancient environmental rights that had been stolen from our citizens over the previous 80 years. And the political system responded. Republicans and Democrats got together. A Nixon created EPA. Over the next 10 years, we passed 28 major environmental statutes that protect our air and water and endangered species and food safety and wetlands, et cetera. And those laws, in turn, became the model for over 100 nations around the world that had their own versions of Earth Day and, and began making their own investments in their environmental infrastructure. But there's a lot of countries that didn't do that. And those were the nations primarily that didn't have strong democracies because democracy and the environment are intertwined. You cannot get strong, uh, sustained environmental protection under any system but a democracy. And, uh, and there's a million reasons for that that I'm not going to go into now. What the major one is that the fishes and the birds and the future generations don't participate in the political process. And so those interests are not heard under any system except for a locally based democracy where individuals who share those or harbor those values are able to inject them into the political dialogue. And that doesn't happen in a tyranny. And, and that's why there's a direct correlation around the planet between the level of tyranny in various governments and the level of environmental degradation, whether it's right-wing tyrannies like you know Brazil during the 70s or Saddam Hussein's Iraq during the 80s and 90s, or the left-wing tyrannies like uh, uh, Eastern Europe and China and the Soviet Union, where they're now you know, facing these economic catastrophes because of their failure to invest in their environmental infrastructure. Russia's a great example. In Russia, they didn't have democracy, so they had no Earth Day, so they had no environmental law. Because of that, for example, they didn't have NEPA, which was the first law and most important one we, we passed, and it's the one that's now absolutely being eviscerated by, by this White House and has already been nearly destroyed by the White House. But, um, but NEPA is the, the law that requires government agencies to do environmental impact statements before they you know, dispense with or destroy a, 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 an important publicly owned resource. They, did, we didn't, they didn't have that in Russia. And because of that, the Aral Sea, which is the largest freshwater body on Earth after the Great Lakes, is now a desert. They didn't have um, a Clean Water Act in Russia. And because of that, the Sea of Isof, which was the richest fish nursery on Earth after the Chesapeake, is now a biological wasteland. They didn't have nuclear regulatory review requirements of the kind we passed in this country after Earth Day. And because of that, one-fifth of Belarusia is now permanently uninhabitable from radiation contamination. In Turkey, where I was this autumn, um, they don't have a Clean Water Act. 300 species have disappeared from the Marmara Sea over the past 15 years. The Black Sea will be dead within 10. In Thailand, where I also was in the autumn, you, they don't have a Clean Air Act. You can see people on any street in Bangkok wearing gas masks and particle masks. The New York Times recently reported that the average child in Bangkok, and this is a city larger than New York, 11 and a half million people, the average child who reaches the age of six has permanently lost seven IQ points because of the density of airborne lead contamination at ground level, because they didn't have a Clean Air Act that said you got to get the lead out of the gasoline. In China, they lose 150,000 people dead every year from smog events. One of the growth industries in Beijing is oxygen bars, where people literally go to buy a breath of fresh air. In Mexico City, if you own an automobile, you can legally only drive it three and a half days a week. Smog inversions kill 10,000 people a year and shut down their principal state industries, sometimes for weeks at a time. In those nations, and many, many, many others, environmental injury has matured into economic catastrophe. And that's what would have happened here if we hadn't made that investment back in the 70s. And that's what will happen if we allow this, this foolhardy Congress and this reckless White House to dismantle 30 years of environmental law. And you know, one of the things that I've been doing over the past several years is to constantly go around and confront this argument that an investment in our environment is a diminishment of our nation's wealth. It doesn't diminish our wealth. It's an investment in infrastructure. 
The same as investing in telecommunications or road construction. It's an investment that we have to make if we're going to ensure the economic vitality of our generation and the next. One of the things that they, they love to say on Capitol Hill, <clears throat> and they, it was the same people saying it about during the civil rights movement, they said, you know, let's get rid of the big bad federal government and we'll return control to the states. And we'll have states' rights and community control. And after all, that's the essence of democracy. And the states are in the best position to patrol and police and protect their own environments. But the real, and that sounds good, but the real outcome of that devolution will not be local control or community control. It will be corporate control. Because these large corporations can so easily dominate the state political landscapes. And we talked about this with Director Cipriano at, at, uh, at, uh, at dinner, how you know companies, these large companies like Monsanto and the chemical and fertilizer companies working through the farm bureaus can absolutely capture an agency like this state's Department of Agriculture and make it work for the corporations and against the interests of the public. And you know that happens in the Hudson Valley, we had we we uh, you know we remember the 1960s version of community control when the General Electric Company came into the Hudson Valley and this tale can be told 10,000 times across this could probably Illinois alone but all across this country General Electric which was the big culprit on the Hudson came into these poverty stricken towns in upstate New York Fort Edward and Hudson's Falls and they said to the town fathers we're going to build you a spanking new factory we're going to bring in 1500 jobs we're going to raise your tax base. And all you have to do is waive your environmental laws and let us dump our toxic PCBs into the Hudson River. And if you don't do it, we'll move to New Jersey. And we'll do it from across the river. And you'll still get the PCBs, but they'll get the jobs and they'll get the taxes. And Fort Edward and Hudson's Falls took the bait. And two decades later, General Electric closed those factories, fired the workers, and they left the Hudson Valley, Valley with their pockets stuffed with cash, the richest corporation in the history of mankind. And they left behind a $2 billion cleanup bill that nobody in the Hudson Valley can afford. And I have a 1,000 commercial fishermen, my clients, who are now permanently out of work because although the Hudson is loaded with fish, the fish are still loaded with General Electric's PCBs and they're too toxic to sell in the marketplace. And the barge traffic on the upper river is dried up because the shipping channels are too toxic to dredge. And all of that beautiful shoreline property that was, that was donated to GE with tax breaks from the grateful localities is now permanently off the tax rolls, robbed from those communities as a source of revenue or recreation. And every woman between Oswego, New York, and Albany has elevated levels of PCB in her breast milk. And everybody in the Hudson Valley has General Electric's PCBs in our flesh and in our organs. And what the federal laws were meant to do was to put an end to that kind of corporate blackmail and to stop these corporations from coming in and whipsawing one community in New York against another in New Jersey or one in Illinois against another Ohio to get them to race to bottom, to lower their environmental standards, to recruit these filthy industries in exchange for the promise of a few years like the hog industry in this state. And, 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 uh, and, you know, and, and bring them into the state in exchange for the promise of a few years of pollution-based prosperity and ransom their children's futures in the process. And what, you know, and, and the federal laws democratized our country. And they allow individuals, you know, they empower individuals, like all the great social movements in American history, this, you know, progressive social movements, the women's movement, the civil rights movement, and the uh, labor movement, were all designed to push out power and allow the vulnerable and alienated members of our society to participate uh, in the debate about, you know, uh, about the direction that our society is going. But, and that's what the environmental movement did by creating permit hearing, environmental impact statements. Anybody in this room, if somebody tries to put a hog facility in your backyard or a landfill or an incinerator or some other obnoxious facility, you have the right to say, wait a second, I, want to, I don't want to listen to your promises. It's fine. I want to see an environmental impact statement, a cost-benefit analysis of all of the costs and benefits of this proposal to my community over the generations, over the long term. And, uh, and then I want a permit hearing. And I want to be able to cross-examine your witnesses and, and, and bring my own witnesses. And, I, and you're entitled to a written transcript of that hearing and a ju judicial decision based upon a rational interpretation of that transcript. And if you don't get it, you can appeal. And, uh, and if there's a polluter in your backyard and the government fails to enforce the law against them, which they almost always do, they just ignore the laws that are on our books, and, uh, and if they do that, anybody in this room can step into the shoes of the United States Attorney 
and uh, drag that polluter in front of a federal judge for penalties of $30,000 a day and injunctive relief. That's what the river keepers do. And, um, and you know, we have these toxic right to know laws and toxic inventory laws that make uh, industry and government more transparent on the local level and give us all the capacity to, to participate, the most vulnerable people in our society, the capacity to participate in a meaningful way in the dialogue that determines the destinies of our communities. And of course, industry says, well, you know, that's terrible, it's costly, and, and you know, we have to do an EIS, and it's going to take us six months or a year, and, um, and, and it's true. Democracy in the short term is inefficient, it's costly, it's sloppy, but in the long term, there's no system that's more efficient. And, I, and you know, the best testimony to that is, that it is what happened to civilian nuclear power in this country where a few guys got together back in the 60s before we had Earth Day and the environmental laws and made the decision that our country was going to walk down the path of civilian nuclear power. We've already, but with no public debate, and we could never say to them, well, what are you going to do with this stuff in 30 years when you have to decommission these plants? You know, for the next 35,000 years, five times the length of recorded human history. And you know, how, how could this be possibly be economic? It's the most catastrophically expensive form of power ever. And they've already run up a half a trillion dollars in cost overruns at the plant, and the big bills haven't even started coming in. And you and I pay them, not the industry. They were able to shift the cost to the rest of us. But it makes no sense. And we would have been able to find that out if we had this process, and we would have been able to spend those trillions of dollars improving our country and investing them in solar energy and wind energy and police and fire and making our country and, and, and museums and enriching our country and our people. But instead, you know, we walked down this dead end because we didn't have those environmental laws in place back then. And, you know, I want to say this, that, that there's no stronger advocate for free market capitalism than myself. I believe that the free market is the most efficient and democratic way of distributing the goods of the land and the, and the bounties of our society. But in a true free market economy, you can't make yourself rich without making your neighbors rich and without enriching your community. Well, what polluters do is they make themselves rich by making everybody else poor. They raise standards of living for themselves by lowering quality of life for everybody else. And they do that by escaping the discipline of the free market by forcing the public to pay part of their costs of production. You show me a polluter, I'll show you a subsidy. I'll show you a fat cat who's using political clout to escape the discipline of the free market and force the public to pay his profits, his production costs. You look at all the, this is any pollution. You look at all the Western resource issues that have driven the environmental movement in this country for the past you know, 100 years, water and grazing and mining and lumber. It's all about subsidies. If you're a farmer in the state of Idaho, and you can get unlimited amounts of our federal water for 11 cents an acre foot. Um, if that's, a, those are, that's our water. We built the dams. You and I, the federal taxpayer, the irrigation systems and the canals, we bought those rivers with Louisiana purchase money. We own it. If we left that water in the river and put it over the dams for hydropower or sent it to the city of Los Angeles for drinking water, we would get $800 an acre foot. So we're giving this farmer a $799 subsidy on every acre foot he uses because he gets the resource for free, he uses it wastefully. He grows rice in the desert. He puts the Louisiana rice farmers out of business, and he sucked every river in Idaho dry. There hasn't been a salmon season in Idaho in 15 years. If you're a rancher in Idaho, you want to graze your cow on my property, you're going to pay me $18 a month. What happens if you have the political clout to get onto our federal land, which you and I own? How much do you think they pay us? $1.61 a month. So we're giving each one of these farmers a $16.39 subsidy on every animal every month, and because he gets the resource for free, he uses it wastefully. He overgrazed the land, he's turned a million acres of our land into desert, he puts the Oklahoma cattlemen out of business because they don't have federal land in Oklahoma, and, and you know, these aren't the, the poor rural cowboy, the icon of American culture that we all want to preserve. 75% of the grazing leases in Idaho are owned by a tiny handful of families, the Simplot, J.R. Simplot, the Hewlett's, the Packard's, and David Russell of Santa Barbara, who alone controls a million acres of our land. These are the richest people in America. These are the same people who financed this revolution on Capitol Hill that you know, began with the Gingrich Congress and has culminated with this White House. And you know, they've got their indentured servants in Washington, D.C., demanding that we have capitalism for the poor. And at the same time, they're fighting for this system of socialism for the rich in the Western states, where we give $35 billion a year in federal subsidies to these welfare cowboys 
who are destroying our resources with that money. And you know, I have to say, because I deal with these guys all the time, that they're a bunch of crybabies, and you can hear them whining when you pull the federal nipple out of their mouths. If you want to cut old growth timber in this country, <laughs> If you want to cut old growth timber in this country, you've got to come to us, the federal taxpayer. You and I, we own it all. In the Tongass National Forest, there are trees that were growing when Christ was walking the earth. Some of these 500-year-old Sitka spruce and cedars have a value on the stump of $20,000. What do we sell them for? $1.89 a piece. And half the Tongass was cut by Alaska pulp and paper, which is 100% Japanese on. They didn't even mill the trees here. They sent them with the bark still on them over to Osaka Bay, where I saw them this summer stacked three stories high and buried under the waterline, just wealth that's being stored, but that was stolen from our, from our children. And it's being stored for generations. And to add insult to injury, you and I, the federal taxpayer, spend $250 million every year building logging roads so that these cut and run timber companies can get up to the last inaccessible parts of our national forest and cut down the last of our children's trees. The worst ripoff is mining. If you're a mining company, and they're almost all foreign owned, and you find gold or silver or hard, you know, hard rock mineral on my property in any of the western states, you're going to pay me usually about 18%, 16 18% royalty to mine it. What happens if you find it on our federal land? How much do you think that they pay us? Zero. They get it all for free. They get the gold, we get the shaft. Now, it, <laughs> seven years ago, American Varick, which is a Canadian company, found one of the biggest mother loads in history, $16 billion worth of gold on our federal land in Nevada. They got the whole thing for $5,000. Why did they have to pay $5,000? Because I said it was for free. Well, the law says not only do they get all the gold below the land for free, but they get to keep all the land above the gold for $2.50 an acre. That's the price that was established by Ulysses Grant in 1879 when he passed the Mining Act and you know he wanted to keep the price of federal land low in order to dragoon Easterners to risk their necks to go out and settle the Indian territories. And these mining companies have such exquisite political clout. They've been able to keep the same price on that land for 130 years. Now do you think that if any of you got tired of the Aurora winters and decided you were going to go retire down to sunny Nevada and you went into that BLM office in Culver City and said to the clerk in there, give me some of that federal land for $2.50 an acre. Do you think anybody would sell it to you? No, it would be illegal. The law says only the mining companies get that deal, but they'll sell it to you when they're done with it, and they'll sell it for upwards of $10,000 an acre, because that's the true free market value of that land. But at that point, you probably won't want it anyway, because they've also used their political clout to write themselves waivers to almost all of the federal environmental laws, so when they leave, they leave behind these giant piles of toxic waste tailings that leach arsenic and mercury and cyanide into our western rivers every time it rains. According to the Federal Bureau of Mines, which is on their side, there are now 9,000 miles of western trout streams that have been sterilized by mining waste from private companies on our public land. And who gets the cleanup bill? You and I. In Montana alone, there are 11,000 toxic waste sites on our federal land by private companies and you and I will spend $20 billion over the next 10 years cleaning it up. That's not the free market. The free market says if you want to bring a product to market, you pay for it to get there. And that includes the cost of cleaning up after yourself, which was a lesson we were all supposed to have learned in kindergarten. But what, what polluters do is they use political clout to escape the discipline of the free market and force the public to pay their production cost. That, and it's not just you know, the Western resource, it's the it's kind of pollution that hog farm, these, you know, these big hog barns like Car uh, Cargill and worst of all, Smithfield and you know, Tyson's are doing in this state every single day. And you know, what GE did on the Hudson, when General Electric dumped its PCBs into the Hudson, it was avoiding one of the costs of bringing its product to market, which was the cost of properly disposing of a dangerous process chemical. When it avoided the cost, the cost didn't go away. It went into the fish, and it made the people sick, and it put the men out of work, and it dried up the barge traffic, and it took the land off the tax rolls, and forced these communities to build water filtration plants. And those impacts impose costs on the rest of us that should, in a true free market system, be reflected in the price of General Electric's product when it makes it to the marketplace. But what GE did, which is what all polluters do, is it escaped the discipline of the free market by using political clout. And it forced the public to pay its cost of production. 
And you know, what we do, what we do is we go out and, and you know, I don't even consider myself an environmentalist anymore. I'm a free marketeer, and that's where all the river keepers are. We go out into the marketplace and we catch the cheaters. And we say to them, we are gonna force you to internalize your costs the same way that you internalize your profits. Because when somebody cheats the free market, the entire marketplace is distorted. And none of us gets the benefits of the efficiencies and the democracies that the free market promises our nations and our, and our communities. And the people, of course, who get hurt the worst are the poorest people in our communities. It's always the poor who shoulder the disproportionate burden of environmental injury. You look where they put these hog farms. They're in, you know, they're, they're not going to put them in Winnetka. They're going to put them in a place where the people don't know the mayor and can't defend themselves. And, I, and you know, you look what happens to toxic waste in this country. Four out of every five toxic waste dumps in America is in a black neighborhood. The largest toxic waste dump in America is Emile, Alabama, which is 85% black. The highest concentration of toxic waste dumps in America is the south side of Chicago. The most contaminated zip code in California is East LA. Uh, Navajo youth have 17 times the rate of sexual organ cancer as other Americans because of the thousands of tons of toxic uranium tailings that have been dumped on their reservation lands. Um, uh, farm workers, Hispanic farm workers, 150,000 of them are poisoned by pesticides every year and God knows what's happening to their children because you know nobody's out gathering data on that kind of stuff. Uh, and certainly the Farm Bureau is not pushing for that, what they, which they ought to be. And the Agricultural Department is not funding it, which they ought to be. That's not what they do. They fund the chemical companies and do what they ask them to do. And you know, but it's not just the poor who get hurt. It's all of us who are getting hurt because we own these resources and that's the important thing for us to remember. The, this, we, the waters of the state are owned by the people of the state. That's what the Constitution of Illinois said, and the fish of the state are owned by the people of the state. They're not owned by the governor. They're not owned by the legislature. They're not even owned by Director Cipriano. They're owned by the people. They're certainly not owned by Smithfield or Cargill. They're owned by the people. Everybody has a right to use them. Nobody has a right to use them in a way that will diminish or injure their use and enjoyment by others. This is ancient law. It's in every state constitution, but it goes back, it comes, it's what, what legal scholars call natural law, God-given rights that no human institution can take away. It goes back to the Code of Justinian um, uh, in Roman law, which, which said that those things that are not susceptible to private ownership, those things that are part of the commons, the, the things that, uh, the air that we breathe, the flowing waters, the, the dune lands, the wetlands, uh, the, the fisheries and the wandering animals, those belong to all the people. If you were a citizen of Rome, uh, you, whether you were rich or poor, younger uh, or old, humble or noble, you had an absolute right to cross a beach and throw in a net and take out a fish. The emperor himself couldn't stop you. And, uh, I, and I, I'll give you a quick history, history lesson. This is a kind of a digression, but this whole talk has turned into a digression. <laughs> when Roman law broke down in Europe, um, during, after the, during the Dark Ages, Many of the kings and the feudal lords of Europe began reasserting control of the public trust resources. Um, for example, in England, King John said that the deer no longer belonged to the people. They belonged to the nobility. And, that's, and nobody could hunt them except for a nobleman. And that's what got him in trouble with Robin Hood. But he also <laughs> erected navigational tolls on the fisheries, on the, on the Thames and the other rivers. And he began selling monopolies to the fisheries. And this triggered a re revolution in England. The public rose up. They confronted him at the Battle of Runnymede. And they forced him to sign the Magna Carta, which was the beginning of constitutional democracy. And the Magna Carta is the source of all of our Bill of Rights, but it also has two additional chapters, one guaranteeing access to navigable waters and, and, uh, and, uh, and to fisheries. And those rights descended the people of the state when we had the revolution in this country. And um, they've been eroded by our courts and by uh, legislatures and by uh, ignorance, but we still have those rights. And the Supreme Court has uh, upheld them. The, 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 these resources belong to the public. They don't belong to the powerful. Every, every kid in Aurora has the right to go down to the local river and pull out a fish and know that that fish is not you know, poisoned by, by fecal material from a hog barn or pesticides or what have you. They have an absolute right to that. Nobody has a right to take that away from them. And yet, you know, in many of our states, um, the fish are now too contaminated to eat, and that's an act of theft. And these fishermen on the Hudson who got together in the 60s, 
you know, they, they weren't sophisticated people. They didn't talk a lot, probably, about the Code of Justinian or the Magna Carta. But they were smart, and they knew that the Constitution of New York said that they owned the fish, and their family had exploited it for generations. And they said, you know, the Constitution says we own them, but we don't own them anymore because General Electric owns them now. They use them up. We can't use them. You know, they liquidate them for cash, and then they left. And they stole our industry because they had political clout, and we didn't. We had a 350-year-old industry, but we didn't have the lobbyists in Albany, and they just stole this from us. And that's an act of theft. And we're going to start treating them as thieves. And they began hauling them off to court, and lo and behold, winning their case. And they not only succeeded in restoring the Hudson, but they also generated this extraordinary wealth of environmental law that's now used across our nation to protect local um, environmental resources. I want to I want to say one, you know, make one last point, which is this, which is that, and it's the point I started off with, which is that the reason that we protect the, protect the environment is not for the sake of the fishes and the birds. It's for our sake, because we recognize that nature enriches us. It enriches us economically, yes, it's the basis of our economy, and we ignore that at our peril. But it also uh, enriches us aesthetically and recreationally and culturally and historically and spiritually. And human beings have other appetites besides money. And if we don't feed them, we're not going to grow up. We're not going to become the kind of beings that we're supposed to become. When we destroy nature, we diminish ourselves. We impoverish our children. And this is really important for Americans to understand. Because we have a stronger connection to nature, um, uh, uh, particularly wilderness, which is the undiluted work of the creator, than any of the other industrialized nations in the world. That from the beginning of time, our cultural leaders and political leaders and religious leaders we're telling the American people, you don't have to be embarrassed because you don't have the 1,500 years of culture that they have in Europe or Asia because you have this relationship to the land and to wilderness and uh, the work of the creator. And that's going to be the source of your values and your virtues and your character as a people. And if you look at our, you know, uh, throughout our history, our, 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 our cultural institutions and political institutions are rooted in nature. And they grew out of it. Frederick Jackson Turner said American democracy came out of the wilderness. Um, our every valid piece of classic American literature, the unifying theme is that nature is the critical defining element of American culture, whether it's you know, Hawthorne or Melville or, or uh, Jack London or Hemingway. Um, uh, uh, all the first great, uh, the first international bestseller we had in our country was James Fenimore Cooper. He was the first bestseller in Europe. And he wrote these you know, leather stocking tales, The Last of the Mohegans and The Pathfinder and the Deerslayer, about this character, Natty Bumpo, who's a creature of the American wilderness. And he has all the virtues that the, uh, that the European romantics associated with the, the woodland. He was self-reliant, and he was courageous, and he was a crack shot, and a great, you know, and, and he had, had a wisdom and a gentleness of the forest, and he was a gentleman, and, uh, and honest, and, you know, and integrity, and all the forthrightness. And, um, it, they, they didn't make him like a, a, a bestseller because it was great writing. It wasn't. It was. It was atrocious. But because they really believed that this new creature was being created out of the American wilderness, and we made him a bestseller in this country because we believed that about ourselves. And a generation after that, you have Emerson and Thoreau come along, who have kicked off the traces of the European heritage, and they embrace nature as the spiritual parent of all Americans. And they say, if you're an American and you want to hear the voice of God. You've got to go into the forest and listen to the songs of the birds and the rustle of the leaves. And if you want to see the American soul, you have to look into the mirror of Walden Pond. And our poets, Whitman, Frost, Emily Dickinson, Robert Service, um, our, our artists. We have two defining schools of art in this country. The Hudson River School, Bierstadt, Thomas Cole, Frederick Church, Samuel F. B. Morris, Cropsey, um, and, um, and the Western School, Remington and Russell. And all of them painted these stark, indomitable portraits of you know, El Capitan and Sierra Nevada and the Catskills and the Adirondacks. And there's other national schools of artists, of art, that have painted nature. The British have their still lives, the French and Italian have their garden and agrarian seeds. But the American artists chose to paint nature in its rawest, most powerful, indomitable state where you know, any evidence of humanity is kind of ant-like and in ruins. And the reason they did that was because they saw that as the way to capture the American soul. This was the essence of what the American character is about. Even our language is taken from nature. Emerson pointed out that if we were raised on a moonscape, our language would likewise be barren, because so many of the, the uh, descriptive terms uh, and, uh, and, and, and the, the, the normative usage um, are, are, are take drawn from nature. Uh, and Emerson pointed out that every word that we have in the English language. Actually, if you go back in time, language becomes
more and more picturesque. And if you go all the way back, it becomes poetry um, uh, it, today, Aboriginal languages. But Everson pointed out that if we were ra it, that, that every word that we have in the English language that expresses a moral fact or a spiritual fact is taken from nature. The word right is taken from a word that means straight. The word wrong is taken from a word that means gnarled or twisted. The word spirit is taken from a word that means wind. The word supercilious means raised eyebrow. So you can go through a dictionary and make these comparisons. But um, this connection was recognized and exploited um, by every uh, 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 religious leader throughout the history of mankind, who's used parables and allegories and fables drawn from nature. Uh, to teach us the difference between right and wrong, and to teach us what the face of God looks like, whether it's the ancient pagan philosopher Issa, the modern Christian theologian C.S. Lewis, and everybody in between, Confucius, Buddha, the Upanishads, Hinduism, um, the Quran, where all the prophets come out of the desert, just like in the Old Testament, and all of them are shepherds, and that daily connection to nature gives them a special access to the wisdom of the Almighty. Uh, and uh, the Old Testament, where the seminal events of the Garden of Eden, which is a mandate for stewardship, and Noah's Ark, which is a mandate for biodiversity. God didn't say to Noah, just bring two of every creature that can demonstrate a current economic value. <laughs> because I made them, and, and they're good. And the New Testament, where Christ is born in a manger, surrounded by animals, and that's not an accident, and where he discovers his divinity for the first time while he's spending 40 days in the wilderness. And that, incidentally, the central epiphany in every religious tradition, whether it's, it always occurs in the wilderness, whether it's Buddha sitting under the tree or Muhammad who had to go to the wilderness of Mount Hera to wrestle the angel on a camping trip, to get the Quran, the Ramadan squeezed out of him, um, or uh, the, the Jews who have to spend 40 years in that wilderness to purify themselves from, from the 400 years of slavery, the Egyptians before they can enter the Promised Land, or Moses has to go up to Mount Sinai, onto the wilderness, alone to get the commandments, and Christ has to spend this time in the desert, and his mentor is John the Baptist, a man of the wilderness who lives in a cave and dresses in the skins of wild animals, and all of Christ's parables are taken from nature. I am the vine, you are the branches, the mustard seed, the little swallows, the scattering the seeds on the fallow ground. He calls himself a fisherman, a farmer, a vineyard keeper. The reason he did that was because that's how he stayed in touch with the people. He was saying things that were revolutionary, that contradicted everything that they'd heard from the literate, sophisticated people of their time. And he would have been dismissed as a quack, but they were able to confirm the wisdom of his parables through their own observations of the fishes and the birds. And they were able to say, he's not telling us something new. He's simply deciphering or illuminating something that is very, very old. There are messages that were written into creation at the beginning of time. And we simply haven't been able to discern them until now. And that's what the prophets are for. Now, when I go into a courtroom or when I sit across a negotiating table from a polluter, it's often difficult to work a lot of this stuff into the conversation. <laughs> because these are, these are currencies that you know, we've integrated into our corporate culture and our traditional culture at this time. But nevertheless, they're critical. I won't say to our survival, because we're an ingenious race, and we could probably devise a way to survive on a rock. But to the quality of our survival, the quality of our communities, of our relationships with each other, our, our capacity to sense the divine, they're absolutely critical. Um, uh, and that's why you know we preserve nature. We're not fighting for the, uh, the, those ancient forests in the Pacific Northwest, as Rush Limbaugh loves to say, for the sake of a spotted owl. We're preserving those forests because we believe the trees have more value to humanity standing than they would have if we cut them down. And I'm not fighting for the Hudson for the sake of the shad and the sturgeon and the striped bass, but because I believe that my life will be richer and my children and community will be richer if we live in a world where there are shad and sturgeon and stripers in the Hudson and where you know my children can, can see the fishermen out on the river doing what they've been doing for generations and touch them when they come to shore and uh, to, to repair their nets or to wait out the ties and connect themselves to 350 years of New York State history and understand that they're part of something larger than themselves. They're part of a continuum. They're part of a community. I don't want my children to grow up in a world where there are no commercial fishermen on the Hudson, where it's all you know Unilever and Gordon Seafood and these 400 ton trawlers 100 miles off the coast strip mining the ocean and with no interface with humanity and where you know there's no family farms left in America where it's just you know it's Smithfield and Cargill raising animals in factories where they never see the light of day and where we've 
we've lost touch with the seasons and the tides and the things that connect us to the 10,000 generations of human beings that were here before there were laptops and that connect us ultimately to God. And I don't believe that nature is God or that we ought to be worshiping it as God, but I do believe it's the way that God communicates to us most forcefully. And God talks to human beings through many vectors, through each other, through organized religion, through the great books of those religions, uh, through wise people, through art and literature and music and, and poetry, but nowhere with such clarity and texture and grace and joy as through creation. And you know, we don't know Michelangelo by reading his biography. We know him by looking at the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. And that, this is where we go to sense the divine. And when we destroy these things, you know, it's a moral issue. We're imposing a cost on ourselves that I don't think is prudent, but on our children, which I doubt we have the right to do. And that's all that environmental advocacy is about. It's recognizing we have an obligation to the next generation and to the people in our community who don't participate in the political process, but still have a right to clean air and clean water and to an unspoiled commons. Just because these, you know, the, these kids in New York City didn't vote doesn't mean that we have the right to steal the air from their lungs and poison it and give it back to them in ways that are going to kill them. And 30,000 people are going to die, according to the National Academy of Sciences, every year because President Bush abandoned new source performance standards. And we don't have a right to do that to people. And, uh, and that's what this advocacy is about. And that obligation to the next generation of the people who don't vote is expressed by the term sustainability. And all that word means is that God wants us to use the things that we've been given, the bounties of the earth, to enrich ourselves, to improve our quality of life, to serve others, but we can't use them up. We can't sell the farm piece by piece in order to pay for the groceries. We can't drain the pond to catch the fish. We can't cut down the mountain to get at the coal. We can live off the interest, we can't go into the capital. That belongs to our children. And what we do as environmental advocates in the Riverkeeper movement is we elbow our way into those back hallways of Capitol Hill and the state capitals where the big shots are back there, you know, with big agriculture in Smithfield and Monsanto, and the Farm Bureau are back there with their indentured servants in the political process, cutting up the pie that belongs to you and me, the fresh water, the unspoiled, uncontaminated aquifers, the wandering animals, endangered species, the things that we all share in common, the air that we breathe. They're cutting it up, they're liquidating it for cash, and they're stuffing their pockets. And we elbow our way into those cabals, and we say, we are emissaries for the future. And we demand an accounting. We want to know what you're doing with things that don't belong to you, with things that belong to our children. And uh, I will close with a proverb from the Lakota people that's been expropriated to some extent by the environmental movement, where they said, we didn't inherit this planet from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. And I would add to that that if we don't return to them something that is roughly the equivalent of what we receive, that they'll have the right to ask us some very difficult questions. Thank you all very much.